James, thank you very much for um, scheduling time to participate in this uh, very interesting uh, workshop for the startup community and the venture capital community. The title that we have assigned to this workshop is uh, Effective Corporate Structuring for Successful Startups. Um, the idea that we have is uh, to share experience uh, around this subject matter. We have experts from Latin America, from Chile, and from Miami, uh, and experts uh, from the Mediterranean. Um, thank you very much, uh, Techsni, Tech for, for inviting us to participate in your summit and to sponsor this uh, very interesting workshop. Um, uh, to our speakers, you know, thank you very much also to, for, you know, scheduling time to participate in this workshop, considering that, that it's, it's a weekend. Uh, and thank you very much for the audience that is going to be participating today live or uh, at a later uh, date, considering that this event is being recorded. Um, Silesh, thank you very much for joining me uh, and for helping me moderate uh, this um, this workshop. Silesh is a group director uh, from JTC uh, out of uh, Channel Islands. And my name is Marcel Imery, director of JTC located in the city of New York. Uh, at JTC, uh, we love to sponsor these type of events because we love to share uh, knowledge and we create uh, virtual spaces where people can learn and create uh, interesting communities surrounding uh, the uh, entrepreneurship and venturing uh, community in Latin America, America and now in Europe and in, in the Mediterranean. Our purpose uh, or what we do at JTC is help um, um, trusted advisors of high net worth individuals and family uh, businesses set up asset protection structures and wealth planning structures we also have help uh, fund managers set up and administer uh, uh, investment funds, private investment funds, you know, venture capital funds, private equity funds, real estate investment funds. And we also help uh, legal advisors like Juan Pablo and Matias, um, you know, set up the correct legal and corporate structures for multinationals and successful startups that are scaling uh, globally or regionally. Um, you know, um, the, 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 our, our purpose today is to, uh, like I mentioned before, to share our, our experience and the experience of the guest speakers uh, around the specific topic of corporate structuring for startups. And with that uh, brief introduction, I'm gonna pass the mic uh, to each one of our guest speakers so they have uh, the opportunity to uh, pitch, you know, their experience and the deals that they have been uh, uh, advising and clients that they have been advising. And then we go, we're going to go into the uh, subject matter in depth so we can share the experience that everyone has on the specific topic. Matias, your, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, Marcel, and, and thank you uh, to Technet for, for the invitation. Um, I mean, very, very happy to, to be here, especially in such good company. Uh, some of you, we have a, a, a very long-standing professional relationship. So it's always good, you know, to, to talk about uh, something as vibrant and, and, ex and, 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 and exciting as, as the, the venture capital uh, ecosystem in, in the region. So, I mean, just very, very brief. I, I don't want to bother you with... Uh, to, to, with, with this, I'm a partner at DLA Piper in, in, in Chile. Uh, I'm the head of the venture capital practice in, in, the, in the region for the firm. I am also part of the Americas Executive Committee. And I have been involved in venture capital in the region for the last, uh, I mean, yeah, almost since the very beginning. I will say that probably one of the first ones was Juan Paulo. So very happy to share this screen <laughs> with him. Excellent. But as you know, I mean, to, to work in the venture capital uh, field uh, first is that you, you, you have to, 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 to have this, um, the, 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 the same type of image, meaning that, uh, I mean, you, you have to be willing to lose some, some hair uh, during the, uh, the, the process, but has been an exciting ride so far. So very happy to be here. Excellent, Matias. Thank you for introducing yourself. Uh, uh, Juan Carlos, the mic is yours. Great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also one of these people who've lost uh, virtually all of my 
all of my hair, um, uh, 20 plus years in the space. Um, we back in the late um, uh, 1990s um, built the first FinTech in Latin America, um, Patagon.com. We sold it to Banco Santander um, uh, for a transaction value of about a billion dollars. It was 700 and plus million in cash plus a $250 million uh, capital increase. Um, and ever since then, I've spent half of my time approximately advising um, startups. We have a uh, law firm, PAG.law. We've helped um, 1,500, um, sorry, we've helped almost 100 founders raise um, $1.5 billion. So um, quite active in the last year. That was just in the last year, 100 founders, $1.5 billion. Um, we've done rounds as large as 500 million um, and, uh, you know, help founders, you know, raise small amounts of capital as well. So anyway, that's, um, that's my background. Real pleasure. Excellent, Juan Pablo. Thank you very much for introducing yourself and bringing all that experience and knowledge to our workshop today. We have our third uh, expert speaker uh, that just connected uh, in the room. Uh, Welcome, Dahoy. Uh, thank you very much for scheduling time to participate in this very interesting topic, uh, a workshop uh, where we're going to be addressing the ideal structuring solutions for successful startups in Latin America and the Mediterranean and see how we can contrast uh, the, two, uh, the two and which are the best practices in each one of those regions of the world. So you, the microphone is yours so you can do your uh, elevator pitch and explain who you are, your experience and the clients and deals that you have been advising in, in this space. Okay, super. Thank you so much, Marcel, and thank you, JTC, for the know for the panel. Uh, always a pleasure to participate and of course thank Techni Summit for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Luis Shawarbi and I'm uh, with and Shawarbi uh, attorneys at law in uh, Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I'm uh, a founder. Uh, we are uh, in the commercial and corporate law space, uh, also including funds and technology and uh, We've been uh, actually uh, uh, close to the ecosystem in Egypt and elsewhere, also in uh, in the region, in especially the Mediterranean region. Uh, on another note, and uh, with another hat, I have been angel investing in startup companies since 2009. I have uh, looked at more than maybe 1,200 companies uh, in order to invest in 25, ending up investing in some 25 companies to date, uh, mostly in Egypt, but also so some uh, towards uh, Europe uh, and elsewhere. And uh, I'm glad to uh, be uh, with you all today and uh, to, you know, to maybe provide a, a two cents, uh, my two cents uh, on, 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 on the topic from both perspectives, the legal and the investing as well. Excellent. Uh, La Hoy, thank you for participating today. And, and finally, but not least, uh, my colleague, uh, Sailesh, uh, you, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcel. Uh, thank you, Techni, as well. I know Tariq, who leads Techni, um, Tariq al Kadi has been a great supporter of JTC as well. And, and likewise, uh, have that, that feeling is mutual by us participating for the first time um, in the summit. Uh, we couldn't be there in person, but perhaps next year we'll come to sunny Alexandria, a great, great city. Uh, you, you are missed and thousands and thousands of people out there. It's really impressive. Ah, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'll join you next year. But uh, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm a director, group director of JTC. Uh, we're a we're a professional services business uh, providing sort of structures. So it's quite uh, structures and administration of structures, uh, whether they're private clients uh, for families or for institutions and uh, or for funds and for investment managers and for uh, you know many uh, collective vehicles which um, are set up for the business angels and startup communities uh, we're listed in london uh, stock market now we have a FTSE 250 company um, we're covering africa uh, uh, middle east africa north africa sub-sahara africa for over 30 years so we have a great deal of experience in dealing with the region and its various nuances, and um, as well as with its diaspora, the wider uh, global diaspora that's linked with Africa. And uh, Egypt is, a, is an important market for us. 
um, and, and the likes of, you know, Lahoy and Tariq, who um, leads Techni, um, a good sort of associates of ours, and, and uh, we look forward to um, the debate today. Well, Silas, thank you very much for um, participating today and, and dealing with the storm that uh, uh, makes a little bit difficult to reach your, your office today. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, great. Now that we uh, everyone knows everybody, uh, I'm going to start with uh, something that we call in, in Spanish, la papa caliente, the hot potato, which is basically um, the big question that's, that entrepreneurs normally ask themselves, uh, which is where to set up the holding company that will uh, be the owner of the, their operating company in where the startup begins operation and eventually the, the owner of the dis different branches of subsidiary that the holding company will open in a number of jurisdictions uh, when the startup begins to scale. Uh, the idea of this uh, informal conversation, but very uh, interesting conversation is to see which are the best practices uh, in Latin America, uh, spe specifically taking into consideration, you know, the the requirements that normally uh, Latin American accelerators and VCs uh, uh, um, uh, uh, require to uh, founders and earlier investors with regard to the structuring uh, as a condition to disperse uh, the initial investments uh, on the startup. And also see exactly which are the best practices in, 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 in the Mediterranean and see there, if there are points of contact, uh, similarities between the two areas of the, of the, of the world and, and the differences. So, so the audience can take note and, and when, you know, if they're considering setting up a structure or restructuring their current structure, they uh, know exactly what's going to be perceived as convenient by the investor community, the private investment community or the venture community. So with that, I'll start with Matias again. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marcela. Yes, I mean, as you said, it's a, it's a hot, hot topic. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes uh, what drives the decision is, uh, I mean, how to raise money. Uh, so, I mean, there is a sort of a little bit foreign shopping regarding that. I mean, one thing is what you want in terms of a structure, what works better for you as a startup company. Uh, what uh, you should be doing in that regard to optimize uh, either your operation or, and or you know a potential exit. But uh, the truth is that uh, I mean, who who puts the money puts the money, uh, plays the music. So uh, there is uh, there are some restrictions there, meaning that uh, today investors are basically open to just a few jurisdictions. Uh, mostly, they would like to to to, to see a startups. Uh, uh, having holding companies incorporating, uh, incorporated either in, in, in Delaware or in Cayman Islands, uh, sometimes in Singapore. And then uh, in, in other cases, uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, the UK and Spain using uh, special uh, tax structures, I mean, called, called, called EPTES. Hmm? I will say that those are the main structures if uh, you are planning uh, to raise money, mainly with the, the tier one, two or three VC firms uh, in, 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 in the US. Having said that, uh, I mean, to reach that point, it, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to start with a structure like that. Because when you are uh, just uh, uh, on an early stage, obviously, you have to focus on your product and your team and have basically to set off. And, uh, and that means that uh, depending on the jurisdiction in which you are in, in the region, you have, I will say that three paths. One is if, if you truly believe that you have, you know, a global product with global reach that you can escalate in a very short, in a, in a very short period of time, you will probably go uh, immediately uh, uh, to, to the U.S. to try to raise money, uh, to operate, et cetera, et cetera. Another option is go to Brazil, and that will depend, obviously, if you're Brazilian, a Brazilian company, or you know, a, a company coming from from another jurisdiction in the region. Uh, but obviously, uh, I mean, 
Brazil is highly attractive, especially if you are in certain verticals, like uh, if you are a, a fintech. Uh, but it's expensive uh, and, and it's a complex jurisdiction as well. But on the other side, you have, uh, you know, the big uh, uh, local VC firms. And then uh, you have another option, which is uh, to grow within what we call the Spanish LATAM. So, so to set up operations in, in, in other jurisdictions, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, sometimes Argentina, sometimes Peru, etc., as a first step, and then you keep uh, growing. So depending on what stage you are, uh, you will have, uh, I mean, a more simple structure. For example, uh, I mean, Chile for many, many, many startups of the region has been uh, quite useful uh, because uh, has a comprehensive network of, of uh, DDP of the uh, double taxation treaties, and and you know it's, it's kind of uh, efficient. Uh, but then it doesn't allow you to raise money uh, with the big busy firms. So it depends on the stage you are. Uh, I mean, what you should be uh, doing. But I'm sure that Juan Paulo, you know, would like to add something about that. Let me, let me ask a, a technical question uh, to, to Matias, uh, Juan Pablo, uh, because, you know, um, as I mentioned before, I had the opportunity to interact with the uh, venture capital and startup community in Chile as founder of a startup that was um, um, sponsored by Startup Chile. Uh, and I have a question for you, uh, Matias. You know, uh, during those days, 2016, uh, one of the requirements um, that Corfo made uh, to VCs that they were required to invest only in Chilean companies. Uh, so I assume that many um, uh, startups, uh, Chilean start, you know, founded by Chilean founders or global founders that moved to Chile to put in motion their, their, their startups were originally incorporated in Chile and some of them were successful and they needed to restructure, okay? To have access to um, venture capital, and, and, and as I mentioned before, you know, I understand that during those days, you know, Chilean venture capitals were not authorized to invest in foreign legal entities. So, in, you know, how does a Chilean startup restructure, uh, you know, to have access to that capital nowadays, considering those rules that were implemented by the Chilean government? Uh, it's slightly different. I mean, uh, I mean, you are allowed, obviously, I mean, and, and to, to invest uh, abroad. And, and it's part of, of the strategy. I mean, Chilean is a, is a small market, but it has uh, a very significant, uh, you know, digital penetration. So it's a good, good market. It's, it's kind of mature in many verticals. It's a good market to, to start and to pivot your, 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 your business model. But you know that you have to, to, to keep growing and keep growing first, probably in the region most of the times. So, uh, I mean, you are definitely allowed uh, to, to do that. And then from a just a legal regulatory framework. In fact, I mean, you have no restriction. I mean, if, if anyone wants to invest in, in Chile, I mean, you're free to do so. There is no restriction. Uh, I mean, for inbound uh, investments, there are no restrictions for outbound investments. So it's quite an easy thing to do. However, it's true that Corfo required at some point that if they were giving away some money to any company, they wanted to, 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 to have that money spent in Chile. Uh, but uh, I mean, obviously, uh, he will in, in, spend money from Chile and in Chile to fund your operations uh, abroad, and that work. Uh, I mean, very, very well. Interesting. Okay, uh, excellent. Thank you very much for your input, uh, Matias, Juan Pablo. You know, what um, can you bring to the discussion uh, regarding that now that, that you're located in the innovation hub of, of the Americas, which is Miami. And based on what you just described, you've been you know, interacting and advising not only startups that uh, are born in the US, but Latin American startups that decide to move and, 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 and coordinate their operations out of uh, Miami or New York or Silicon Valley. Sure, no, uh, real pleasure. Um, and again, um, thank you so much for, for inviting us. Yes, yeah, Matias said, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, in venture, like in you know many parts of life, it's the golden rule. He who has the gold rules, and um, in in venture, about a year and a half ago, TechStars 
posted a made a post whereby um, they said they would only invest in companies based in the United States, in Delaware, in Canada, in Cayman, and in Singapore. And so the reality is there's only four alternatives where to you know, base your, um, your holding company. Um, there, you know, you might be able to argue for a holding company in the UK and a couple of other jurisdictions, but there is in venture, we have to accept this sort of group think where, you know, um, best practices sort of get adopted and everyone just moves to that practice. And so pretty much, again, you just have Delaware, Cayman, Canada, and Singapore. For Latin America, which may be very different than for Europe and um, other jurisdictions, um, of those four, really it's just the United States, Delaware C Corp, and Cayman as alternatives. And so last year, as I mentioned, we advised um, about 100 non-US founders, mainly from Latin America, um, they raise 1.5 billion, but more, more interestingly for this conversation, um, 75 of those used a U.S. Delaware C Corp, and 25 of those used Cayman. So it's just Cayman um, uh, versus De Delaware. I've shared in the chat three articles, um, hopefully for the people participating in person. Um, somebody can can share those links. Um, as Matias or you alluded to, um, I think at JTC, you guys think of you know more um, structured solutions. We often see um, uh, companies if they want to do some tax planning, they'll use a um, Spanish ETVE and ITVE. Um, in their structure, not as a holding company under the holding company. Um, it's a structure that uh, works quite well and saves a lot in, in taxes. Also to piggyback on something Matias said, um, I totally agree. So there used to be, um, you know, in Latin America at least, if a company wanted to scale, they went to Brazil. Um, there's an expression, um, throughout Latin America that Brazil is not for amateurs, which is in one a polite way of saying that Brazil's for Brazilians. Um, and it's quite hard. Um, and there aren't a huge number of success cases of Latin Americans going to Brazil, um, uh, from Spanish speaking Latin America going to Brazil. Um, there, there are some exceptions, but in general, um, it's, it's not gone particularly well. And so, you know, it was really out of Chile that you began seeing this, um, uh, we say Alianza del Pacifico, the, the Alliance of the Pacific, which are these, you know, basically it's Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. And if you add up that market, um, it's about 200 million people, which is about the same size as Brazil. So if you're a Latin entrepreneur, um, at least 2010 to 2015, um, and you wanted to regionalize, you sort of went to Brazil. Um, starting around 2015, 2016, we began to see, you know, companies going either from Mexico to Colombia, to Chile, to Peru, Chilean companies like Corner Shop going up to Mexico, but you began seeing this Pacific Alliance um, strategy. And um, Miami has become part of that strategy. Last year in Miami, there was actually just in South Florida, there was um, just as much venture capital invested as the whole of Latin America. It's actually really interesting when you actually look at the numbers um, that there was as much invested in Florida in venture as all of Latin America. And so Miami's become a big tech hub um, just in the last year. There's been a, it's known as the tech sedis from Silicon Valley and from Los Angeles. And pretty much all of that capital has ended up either in Miami or in Austin, Texas. And obviously the capital 
um, that's more internationally focused has tended to come to Miami. And so um, Miami's really surged as a tech hub somewhat unexpectedly in the last um, year and a half. And, um, you know, happy to discuss that. Interesting. You know, last week, uh, probably you, you, you are aware that um, uh, here in New York and, and this time virtually, uh, like the uh, Techni uh, Summit um, was organized and the um, LAFCA Summit, okay, or the mm -hmm. LAFCA uh, yearly uh, Congress. And one of the interesting things that um, um, I took note of is, um, is uh, how, how much the venture capital community has, growth, has grown in the past uh, three years in Latin America. And, um, you know, after seeing that, it, it's, you know, I, I'm beginning to reach the conclusion that nowadays for a Latin American startup that is focused only on doing business in Latin America and not in the U.S., is uh, a lot easier to raise capital than five, seven years ago, okay? So my question is, you know, let's assume hypothetically that you're advising a founder uh, or a group of founders are uh, scaling uh, a, a startup in Latin America with no intentions of doing business in the US um, and no intention of raising capital at any US incubator or any VC located in the, in the US. They, they will do only business in Latin America, raise capital from angel investors located in Latin America and VCs only located in Latin America. Does it make sense uh, to set up a, a holding company in that specific case in the US? And if the, the answer is yes, is why? And the, if the answer is no, why? I think that that would be very interesting, a very interesting topic to analyze. Let, let me let me let me take a crack at that. I think your your supposition is isn't really realistic. I, okay. So um, there's there's not an entrepreneur. I mean, all entrepreneurs, and I'm one of them. I have a okay. mental wellness company. We've raised millions of dollars in the last um, year. We have six titans of tech on our cap table. Um, all entrepreneurs suffer from, you know, the Don Quixote complex that we all believe that our company is going to change the world. Um, and most of us, you know, are just uh, fighting against uh, imaginary windmills. Um, there isn't an entrepreneur in Latin America who doesn't believe that he or she is going to be raising lots of money from, you know, top tier international venture capital firms. So, um, what I always say is a Delaware C Corp makes sense if the founders are in the U.S., if the IP was created in the U.S., if the U.S. is an important market for the company and it's eventually going to have significant U.S. operations. If those three statements are not um, valid for your company, then I do recommend you work and you set up a Cayman holding company. So again, are the founders based in the US? Was the IP created in the US? And is the US an important addressable market? If you, you know, if two of those three exist, you might as well probably go to, you know, you probably might as well set up a US holding company from day one. Um, the other thing I would just mention and now this is because we've seen mega rounds. We've seen, um, I think two years ago, there was like three or four unicorns in Latin America. I believe today there's 30. There's a couple that have just come out of Chile. So it's almost becoming a weekly phenomenon that we see a new unicorn, a billion plus dollar company coming out of Latin America. What that has meant is we're seeing mega rounds. You know, when we sold Patagon for 700 plus million dollars, that was the largest venture transaction for the next 10 years or more, actually like 15 years. There wasn't a deal as big. Now we're seeing $700 million rounds of financing. We at our firm just closed a $500 million round of financing. Wow. What's happening? Virtually 
every company that's raising over two, three hundred million dollars has to get moved back to the United States. So just to keep in mind, you know, Matias and I will help companies set up the Cayman holding structure um, to create tax efficiency, et cetera. But again, la regla del oro, the golden rule, he who has the gold rules. What we're seeing is many of the biggest funds when they're investing 200, 300, 500, $700 million, they're saying to the founders, it's very nice you're in Cayman, we like Cayman, but now that we're putting in so much money and value in your company at a billion, two billion, three billion dollars, we really need to be focused on an exit. And it is going to be easier to um, take the company public or otherwise look for an exit with you as a US holding company. So what we are seeing, which is interesting, is in the last year with these mega rounds, one consequence is many of those founders of these unicorns are being pushed to, to re-domicile from Cayman to the United States. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with Juan Pablo. I mean, just to, to give you an example, our office in, in Palo Alto in the last two weeks have closed deals uh, worth uh, $5.7 billion just in the last two weeks. And in average, I mean, the region, I mean, uh, the, the, the price tag of uh, the different uh, rounds is, is, you know, it's getting insanely higher and higher and higher. Every time, and I mean, 15 years ago, a robust Series A was around 500 k, 750 k. Today, I mean, it's, it's obviously uh, 10 times that, and even more, just in the region, which is different than, than in the U.S. And we have done <clears throat> in the region the last. Uh, I mean, we have seen the same trends that Juan Pablo was mentioning before. I mean, we have in the last year we, we we have done in the region. Uh, more than a couple of hundred deals. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just a hot, hot market. But it's true at the same time that sometimes uh, uh, the, the, the companies uh, get an exit before they expect it. And many entrepreneurs are in this crossroad. I mean, they have this vision of changing the world. They believe that they have a fantastic product, but there are other companies that probably were yeah, or are in, 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 in the same vertical uh, uh, now and were before and they want to expand into the region. So those companies, I mean, BCVAC as well, uh, they are looking for opportunities to keep growing and growing fast and uh, being aggressive. So we are seeing a trend of uh, uh, M&A deals exits on an early stage. I mean, in fact, right now, I mean, only this year, we have closed uh, an, an, uh, five of those, and I mentioned in only Chile, and we are working in four more. So, you know, we are close to get one per month. Wow. And, 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 and that's, that's relevant, I mean, in the, in the way that th those companies are, are growing. I mean, not all of them uh, are, are corner shop. I mean, what we advise, <laughs> we're joint counsel for Uber and corner shop, I mean, for for those of you who, who are not familiar with the transaction, uh, I mean, Uber acquired in, in two different phases. Uh, Corner Shop uh, uh, was a startup that uh, was cre created in Chile using the structure that Juan Pablo mentioned before and was acquired by, by Uber. Uh, the price tag at the end of the day was uh, $3.2 billion. We just closed that uh, now in, in August. And... Uh, and so we are seeing both things, you know, really big exits. We are seeing uh, exits on an early stage where the entrepreneurs want to cash out and, and it's an equity hire, but they will probably keep uh, creating new businesses in the, in the future. And, uh, but we are seeing tons of traction as well, but towards the vision that Juan Pablo was, was mentioning uh, before. Interesting, very interesting. You know, the, 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 it, the, it's um, quite something what's going on in Latin America nowadays. You know, the industry is vibrant, uh, it's growing fast. Um, 
excellent for entrepreneurs because there is more, more cap, private capital available for them than ever before. And great uh, for, for uh, Latin American VCs and US VCs because Latin America offers is a great market with great entrepreneurs and great startups. Let's contrast- yeah, and Marcel, I'm sorry, let me add something about that. Uh, I mean, we are seeing also more and more activity coming from the big busy firms. I mean, the Sequoias of, or, or the Anderson's of, of this world that were more focused first in, in obviously in the internal market, in the US market, then in Asia and now in Latam. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's also interesting uh, when you discuss these mega rounds that Juan Pablo was also uh, referring to. Well, look, look at SoftBank, you know, they, they, the recent decision of creating a, a huge fund only to be investing in Latin American startups. That's, that's great uh, for the ecosystem. Uh, La Hoy, now I'm going to pass the microphone to you so you can uh, share the Mediterranean experience and see which similarities it has with what uh, Juan Pablo and Matias have shared uh, about the best practices of Latin America compared to what you're seeing in that side of the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Marcel. You know, for the, it, it looks like it's not far, uh, it's not, uh, uh, the, the, the quite a number of similarities, or a lot of similarities actually between the two. Uh, I think everyone is trying to be in competition somehow with either Delaware or with the, uh, Or with the or with the uh, offshore jurisdiction uh, and a few others, you know, of the same cohort, and it's all about uh, investor interest. As uh, Capello was uh, Juan, Juan Pablo was saying at the beginning, is that you know it's uh, uh, it's usually uh, startups uh, incorporate investors feel uh, comforted the most, and the inf uh, investors feel comforted uh, where they come from uh, sometimes, or where you know with the jurisdictions that they know most about. And this is uh, why, you know, when there has been an ambition in Egypt or elsewhere in the Mediterranean region to raise funds from U.S. companies, uh, many of the uh, entrepreneurs sought in order to impress that they should actually incorporate their companies in Delaware. When there was no, uh, no uh, good reason actually to be in Delaware. So, you know, so we give uh, many times we give the same advice actually as, uh, as, uh, as our colleagues here. Uh, mentioned is that you know if you're not raising decent amounts of funds from the U.S. or if you do not have a uh, market interest in the U.S., then do not go to the U.S. You know, just incorporate somewhere else, maybe you know uh, uh, some of some of these jurisdictions, uh, and 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 that should do it. Uh, in uh, Europe, we have seen that uh, many companies uh, actually are not incorporating in the Mediterranean specifically, but are going to Holland. Holland seems to have run. Uh, so many programs and schemes that have given lots of, uh, uh, you know, ease uh, for investors and also for startup companies. So we find a lot of companies uh, from the region incorporating actually in Holland, uh, in, 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 in Holland. So, and, and, and we're seeing that trend actually, sorry, just a second. And we're seeing, we're seeing actually the trend uh, increase uh, Increase uh, increase over time, and and and, and of course, uh, uh, Italy and France uh, also uh, seem to have been uh, you know looking at how to compete with Delaware and put you know some companies and put some some uh, some uh, some incentives, uh, and 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 nothing you know has materialized enough you know for the for the young entrepreneurs. So, anyways, bottom line, I think there's a lot of ambition actually by entrepreneurs, you know, uh, incorporating companies in Delaware just to feel that they have a US company even when they do not need it. And at the same time, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, regulatory competition trying to catch up with the with the ease and flexibility of doing business that you'll get uh, actually in uh, in Delaware uh, uh, for the, for the other uh, for the other uh, for the other guys as well. Uh, so, uh, and uh, also the size of the rounds, as uh, one of our colleagues was saying, that the size of the round does uh, also inform. So, uh, what we typically advise our, uh, you know, uh, 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 startups and entrepreneurs from the region is that we say, you know, you can set up anywhere at the beginning, just to get things moving, and then uh, after a while, when you start to get some decent funding, then maybe you can reincorporate somewhere else. And uh, you know, this is uh, we take this to be. The better advice uh, for now, uh, mostly for the lack of a better option of, uh, you know, of an offshore jurisdiction that is going to give some, uh, 
good pricing uh, to start deficit. Um, so, so anyways, I think I think I think it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of things, but you know, it's a, I think it's a global thing, and the, and just entrepreneurs all have similar ambitions. And they want to be in the in the in the in the in the bigger jurisdictions to attract more funds, uh, and you know when when eighty percent of startups fail, it doesn't much matter where you are, whether you are incorporated in the US or anywhere else, and uh, and and this remains uh, open questions I think to be uh, to be uh, to be seen uh, into the future. Uh, uh, um, I'm not sure you know what uh, what. What 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 else is there? You know that have not been covered by my, by my colleagues. You know, uh, and uh, and uh, Tigers uh, to cover so the basic things. Yes. You know, of course, there's another dimension actually of some companies also from the region. You know, uh, 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 incorporating in the UAE in Abu uh, in uh, in the UAE, especially in Abu Dhabi, over the last few years they. Put together a team for the holding company, but that's not, you know, uh, has not also generated sufficient interest to it to compare, for instance, with BBI or or Holland, uh, which figure drift of the North American and North African and, uh, and North African uh, uh, companies. So, anyways, I think that that. So that's it for now, and uh, maybe we can come back with uh, some follow-ons later. Okay. Salesh, I don't know if you have any questions regarding this very interesting topic of um, in which jurisdictions should the founders and early investors um, consider, you know, setting up the, a holding company to operate the business. Yeah, so, sometimes you've got to look at where your audience is, you know, where are the investors coming from, and Often, I know in the region with La Jolla, will also sort of uh, concur with that, and and also in sub-Saharan Africa as well, as well as the GCC in North Africa. I think that the investors are usually the wider diaspora that's living outside. So, so in Egypt's case, you know, a lot of them are Egyptian diaspora from the US and from Europe, investing back into their countries, and and um, often investing in sort of new new sort of technology and new sort of business lines. Um, you've also got family offices, wider family offices looking at the region, uh, especially from GCC, are big investors within, within uh, you know, the, the slightly larger funds that come in. Um, or you have institutional investors who, who have much, you know, larger funds that come in from Europe and US who are looking to invest in, in projects which are linked with renewables and sustainability and social impact and so forth. And, and often they're looking at the underlying services as to what impact that's having on and in developing and adding value to local communities. And, uh, and these investors all come with different perceptions of the way they want their investment structured, right? Um, yes, tax is one side of the coin, but actually what they're looking for is ease of entry into the market. Um, they're looking at, to a degree, tax neutrality in terms of the actual vehicle into which they're investing in, uh, the investor vehicle. The investor vehicle could be, you know, Caymans, could be um, uh, other jurisdictions such as uh, uh, Netherlands and Luxembourg are increasingly coming into play for larger institutional investors because, you know, they are not perceived to be offshore in that sense. You know, they're onshore and they're part of the EU, European Union. Um, and at the next stage, it's easier to raise, you know, much bigger capital uh, from those jurisdictions. But there are some investors like family offices and uh, individuals from the diaspora and also, you know, individuals living from Africa um, will, will be quite content with centers like Jersey or uh, Channel Islands, um, uh, Isle of Man, uh, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, which are in that sense gives them that neutrality that they're looking for. They don't want the messy bit in between for their investment. They're happy for the for the underlying venture to take care of the local tax matters that, that they require and the obligations. Um, and they will take care of their own tax matters in their own countries. But the actual vehicle, they want to be in a neutral jurisdiction, which, which doesn't have 
you know, there's no impediments in terms of the vehicle paying uh, any withholding taxes or capital taxes or income taxes even. So, so we find that those sort of, I mean, with JTC, we've got 25 different offices in, you know, from US to Caribbean, to Europe, to Singapore, to Mauritius, to 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 you know Lahoy mentioned uh, uh, Dubai and and Abu Dhabi so so for us we're neutral in terms of what happens so but it's a lot to do with perception of of who's investing in and uh, um, often it's a cost factor as well remember that startups when they're starting up a nature you know don't have the resources to put in fancy structures and get fancy advice you know so so and, and it's something that you know, Marcel and myself are looking at to see how, how can we ease that path so that it can, as they grow, we can then provide greater services, provide greater economic substance for those vehicles. I think, you know, you've got to have local directors in these jurisdictions. Um, you've got to show some, some substance there to, to make it sort of stand up for tax purposes as well. So I think, I think that's, um, um, it, it's different horses for different courses in a way, right? Um, um, as, as to where a structure would work for, for a particular startup and its founders. Excellent, Silesh. Thank you for your input. You know, uh, one of the great, uh, the words that I like the most if you're in, uh, involved or engaged in the, in the tax um, industry or planning uh, profession is neutrality. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, this question is for you, Juan Pablo. No? Um, some of the people that may be uh, um, listening or viewing this uh, uh, content, this video at a later date would probably like to understand uh, which are the differences from a tax point of view of um, closing an exit deal um, through a holding company incorporated in a neutral jurisdiction like Cayman uh, compared to striking a deal and you know processing uh, an exit uh, through a company or holding company that is located in the US. I don't know if you have you know um, experience or you can share uh, the after-tax impact of the two options you know the two uh, hypothetical exits. You're, you're muted. Perfect. Um, th that, that's a great question. Um, and there's nothing like dollars and cents to uh, focus the mind. Um, so the situation's as follows. Um, sometimes US uh, venture lawyers will say to an entrepreneur, international entrepreneur, you should, you know, there's no thinking. You just need to be a Delaware C Corp for any, um, institutional investor to take you seriously. And unfortunately, um, up until about 2013, every, virtually every single entrepreneur from Latin America followed that advice. Um, and I kept raising my hand saying that advice is lazy advice. And um, you know, there, there are alternatives. And what I would hear back is, well, two things. One, three things. One, entrepreneurs shouldn't worry about taxes. They should worry about growing their company. I, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Two, um, there aren't going to be any U.S. taxes due because um, startups lose money forever. Not necessarily the case. Um, and three, you shouldn't worry about it if you're a non-U.S. person, because in the United States, non-U.S. taxpayers do not pay capital gains tax. So if a non-U.S. founder, you know, if I'm, I'm non-U.S., I buy shares in Amazon, I buy them for 100, I sell them for 1,000, I do not pay capital gains. I pay zero in capital gains tax. So there was this notion that entrepreneurs shouldn't care about tax planning. The problem with that is at least 60% of M&A transactions, the buyer does not buy the US holding company. 
because a U.S. holding company is very tax inefficient. About 60% of the transactions, the buyer buys the underlying operating companies. So I'm going to give you an example. Before the Cayman LLC structure, which is the Cayman structure, existed, a good friend of mine, an Argentine entrepreneur, rather unsophisticated, um, calls me up one day and says, hey, um, I remember that company I told you I was starting nine months ago. Yes. Um, great news. We've found a buyer. Um, somebody's going to buy us for $2 million. It isn't the exit we wanted, but you know, we just started a few months ago and um, we're very excited and would like you to help us with the, um, with the sale. Great. When he sends me over the documents, I see that he has a USC Corp set up. I said, when did you set this up? He's like, oh, 500 startups, amazing accelerator. Um, it was supporting us. They gave us $12,500 in cash and support services. And they told us to receive that cash, we needed to set up a, USL, a USC Corp. Great. I look at the purchase documents. This company has an Mexican subsidiary and an Argentine subsidiary. The purchaser was buying the subsidiaries, was not interested in buying the C Corp. I had to, at that point, let this entrepreneur who does not, who's never been to the United States, never been to the United States, doesn't have a client in the United States. And the only connection he has with the United States is 500 startups gave him $12,500 and forced him to set up a C Corp. That transaction now ended up paying $700,000 in taxes to the US government. $2 million transaction, $700,000 in taxes, the entrepreneur had never been to the United States. Because of that horror show, I was able to convince Kasek Ventures, one of the most well-known funds in the region, NXTP, one of the most active funds in the region, on the next transaction to allow the entrepreneur to, rather than set up a USC Corp, to set up a Cayman structure. So we really, I don't want to say invented, but we really were the lawyers who convinced a number of funds to accept a Cayman holding company as a reasonable alternative to Delaware for Latin founders. So you to answer your question, about 60% of M&A transactions the purchaser does not want to buy a U.S. C Corp, 60%. Um, and when that happens, if, you, if, the, if the entrepreneur has a U.S. C Corp, they should assume that there's going to be about 30% taxes due, whether the investors are U.S. or non-U.S. So the tax considerations are quite, quite relevant. Absolutely. Well, it's a great thing that you guys, as a legal counsel of, um, you know, uh, very successful Latin American entrepreneurs and startups uh, have done, you know, a great job um, explaining to the industry, uh, the incubators and the, you know, VCs that it's absolutely necessary uh, to consider options different to just setting a C corp in the U.S. You know the tax impact if you sell the underlying business through a, a C corp it's it's huge. So and at the end, you know not only the founders benefit from having a more sophisticated and fish tax efficient structure, but also the early investors, which are the angel investors and the VCs. So the advice or the power tip is something very convenient for everyone that is interacting with this. Um, in this ecosystem. Um, I don't know if, um, um, if Silesh, you, you, you have any, any comments with regard to that? Yeah, uh, no, thank you, Marcel. I just thought it would be interesting to hear because we're in, uh, because we're in Alexandria and there's an audience listening there, perhaps Lohoi to give us a feel of the 
business angels community because I know you yourself uh, are an investor, but you also serve on the boards of different business angels networks. So, you know, for example, the Mediterranean business angels, which includes all of that Eastern Med region, as well as the Egyptian uh, one. And just give us a feel of how, what activity, how you sort of uh, liaising, and I know Tariq. Who yeah, sure. I thank you, Simon. Mentioned as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, 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 there's a huge, there's a huge, uh, uh, you know, potential for angel investing currently, and it's uh, increasing over the past few years. Uh, you know, around uh, at least Egypt, there's 100 million people, uh, mostly young population. So many opportunities. Uh, a lot of the economy is shifting from uh, analog to digital. So there are so many opportunities in that sense. A lot of things are also happening on the fintech side, but also the non fintech side, a lot of health tech and a lot of, uh, you know, even legal tech uh, at this point. Uh, so this is, you know, starting from Egypt and uh, what goes for Egypt actually goes the same for most of North Africa, the Arab side of the Mediterranean, uh, particularly as well, you know, uh, Morocco, which has also a decent uh, population upwards of 30 million, I believe. The remainder of the countries or the rest of the countries, each greater on its own, of course, but uh, you know they uh, they have lesser populations, but also the same needs. So this is on the on the on the southern side of the of the Mediterranean. On the northern side of the Mediterranean, there's also uh, uh, tremendous networks. You know, uh, on the Latin uh, side of uh, of the Mediterranean, uh, the Italians, the French, and the Spaniards. Uh, hundreds of networks are already there, and this is actually why also we set up the Mid Angels because the Mid Angels is a network of networks. So we're inviting everyone, you know, to do more cross-border transactions and investments and co to co-invest together. And uh, we just uh, uh, actually closed the first investment uh, on a Barcelona Spanish company called Dog is in Town. And uh, it attracted, you know, investors from Egypt and uh, uh, Alex Angels and also from uh, France, one of the, one of the uh, unicorn uh, accelerator in France. So the, 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 there's a lot that is happening actually at this point. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of benefits, you know, getting uh, a lot of uh, investor diversification and a lot and a lot of support as well as the entrepreneurs because, you know, now if you can expansion and a lot of benefits uh, that, uh, that can happen, uh, but, but, you know, just very briefly, again, most of the transactions, you know, uh, companies are incorporated in different places, but most of the transactions, you know, try to look for uh, 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 a low cost jurisdiction to get started and to give comfort to investors. And, uh, you know, this ends up uh, typically being either one of the uh, usual, uh, usual, uh, usual uh, 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 offshore jurisdictions as BVI or Cayman or, uh, you know, or Mauritius or elsewhere, but mostly BVI and Cayman. Or if uh, people, as Silish was, was saying, also would like to get, you know, an onshore uh, feel of it, then, you know, they probably end up in Holland. Uh, you know, this is for the initial for the initial uh, uh, incorporations for uh, for uh, further follow on funding. You know, when when the funding the funding where, where the funding gets bigger, you know, then uh, most of the investors would insist on you know on jurisdictions that they really like rather than jurisdictions that they just can live with, and this you know takes us into either Europe proper or the US, uh, or you know sometimes they can also continue with with uh, with Cayman. Uh, or, or, or BVI, uh, but you know, but this is if they end up being individual investors or family offices. Uh, all the FDIs, the financial development institutions, would not uh, would only accept you know maybe Holland or Luxembourg in Europe or you know somewhere where they have to get the most comfort. Uh, and uh, uh, again, in, in in recap, also uh, you know most of this uh, uh, you know. Is done because uh, investors want to feel comfortable. Uh, uh, tax is one issue, but tax neutrality once 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 achieved, tax neutrality is already enough. What is uh, more, as well, is that uh, many of the legal uh, systems of our countries do not allow for certain things which investors want, uh, and this is why also in investors and uh, so also founders want to give them comfort and they go to incorporate abroad. So for instance, in Egypt, we do not have a straightforward legal tools where you can give uh, vesting, you know, so this becomes an issue because of course, most, if anyone is working with, with, found, with, with founders and startups and, and investing, they know that, you know, you, you know, you, you come
Sorry, Lohoi, you've broken up because you're moving around. Plus, I'll be small and it's all the time of your uh, efforts. And this is why you can't just give someone, you know, the, the you know, the whole ownership, uh, you know, in day one. So you need maybe three, four years to vest. And, uh, you know, because vesting is not uh, is not uh, allowed under Egyptian law. So we try to do some agreements on the side or we try to find the jurisdiction that would allow for more contractual arrangements whereby you know it becomes agreeable among everyone that this is uh, that this is the case and uh, not only also we had issues with convertible notes because convertible notes you know uh, most of them in egypt they are treated for instance it's almost as if it's a bond and uh, therefore and it's uh, no 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 uh, convertible note has been put to the market yet the fra which is the financial regulatory authority has been working on one for the last couple of years should be out at some point, but you know, until that happens, people needed to find the solution, jurisdictions to try to provide what is needed and to provide the comfort needed. And uh, you know, and, and, and so, so, so many, so many of those. So it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of interesting things. And uh, you know, the one of the The lessons or takeaways from today is actually in, uh, between the Middle East and I could, you know, I could uh, easily compare uh, also the uh, Brazil effect with the Egypt effect in terms of, you know, if you want to scale, you know, this is 100 million people, just like in Brazil, maybe 200 million people. So, you know, so. Okay, I'm sorry. Loho is breaking up myself. So, so. You know, Tunisia is a few millions, maybe two. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Sorry, Loho, yeah. you keep breaking up, so I'll be hearing you in bits. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, okay. So I was just trying to say, you know, that uh, you know that there's, there's I, I can see a lot of similarities actually between the Mediterranean region and uh, and and also what you have in Latin America, and uh, the, you know, yeah. because it's, uh, I, I could easily associate yeah. also huge populations. And 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 and, and tremendous. Of course, each other country is, is already uh, great on its own, but you know there are uh, some uh, bigger countries, and uh, I think there could be a lot of also opportunities. You know, in terms of uh... Laho, your connection is is very bad. Uh, very bad. I'm, I'm gonna. Globalizing I don't know. Or, uh, I don't know some, how much, but anyways, I hope that uh, Paulo and and, and Matias, uh, how much time you guys have, uh, so we can uh, coordinate the closing of the virtual room. Three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Good, yeah. Okay. I was just yeah. finally. I, I was just saying. I was just saying that I hope that uh, Silas and Marcel would uh, uh, help you as well in finding. You know. Uh, a, 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 a clear, uh, efficient uh, structure for startups, you know, to start from day zero rather than wait, because the important thing for us actually is that uh, once the company starts, if it's in a wrong, uh, if it's in a wrong jurisdiction, you know, uh, VCs would uh, have the uh, tendency not to look at it unless it is a stellar company. So I think that you know that's also another another dimension that was not brought into the discussion. But you know, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the suggestion. It, the whole, it, you know, um, being incorporated in the right is your chances of being picked up. Yeah, thank right? you very much for the suggestion. Thank, your your communication you. is a little bit bumpy, but I I think we got the message, and and that's one of yes. the our goals. Uh, Silesh and I are working. Um, uh, intensively in finding a solution that will allow um, uh, founders and, and we'll support investors, as well. you know, um, set up the correct structure to begin their operations with something efficient and that they can, and, and a solution that also works when they scale and eventually when they sell in the future. I want to close with this uh, question. And, and also, I would like you guys to um, leave the room with a, uh, with a power tip or, or sharing a power tip, just one, one for each one of yours. You know, one of the things that, uh, as I, I was mentioning at the beginning of this conversation that we do at JTC is uh, help trusted advisors of high net worth individuals design and implement wealth planning solutions, okay? And many entrepreneurs in, in the region um, and many early investors like angel investors are becoming millionaires or billionaires because their, their, their startups are you know, 
scaling fast and and you know if 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 they're lucky they, they some of them have had the opportunity to sell their businesses okay to larger companies or you know or larger startups um so so i have like like a big question is is wealth planning something relevant for founders and angel investors um and and if the answer is yes when is it uh, something relevant when do you guys as advisors of these successful startups begin to talk about the need of thinking on the design and implementation of a wealth planning solution considering that they if they're successful selling their business they're going to make millions Well, uh, as we said before, you know, it depends on, 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 on the situation of the company. You know, if, if, if you are working with a, an early stage company, I will say that, you know, just focus yourself on the business, on your startup. Uh, obviously, uh, sometimes how you start the business is not the most tax efficient uh, way to do it. But uh, I mean, first comes first. And, and, and to us, uh, first is being successful for you with, with, with your business. There will be some time to, 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 to do some tax planning, to flip the structure, to look for the most efficient way to do it. And, and, and if you, you know, work with the right people, uh, I'm sure that you will find some, some solutions there. But I mean, don't start having a sort of Ferrari in terms of uh, structure that uh, when, when you need, you know, a four wheel drive because the, the road, you know, will be bumpy. Uh, and and uh, so it's a matter of uh, in which stage you are, uh, basically. Obviously, I mean, if you start to, to, to do business uh, in several jurisdictions, if you are starting to raise money, uh, etc., perhaps that's the right moment, you know, to consider how to structure yourself. I mean, perhaps to how to allocate your IP in a low tax jurisdiction. I mean, how to create a, 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 a network of intercompany agreements to do some, to have a, a transfer pricing uh, study. Uh, I mean, to be aware of uh, some, I mean, Paulo mentioned this before, but in some jurisdictions there are indirect taxes. If you sell a holding company that has substantial <laughs> business in different jurisdictions. So there are some matters to consider, but I will say that you know, at the beginning, just keep it simple. Don't expand, you know, that much money uh, thinking about this because, I mean, your first concern should be to, to, to create a business. And then uh, after that, you will be in a position to, to think more carefully about, you know, how to optimize from a tax standpoint your business. So half of the entrepreneurs that we work with who have unicorns, so, um, you know, billion plus dollar companies don't even have a will. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. Half of the entrepreneurs who we work with, who are, who founded billion dollar companies do not even have a will. So, um, yeah, a lot more needs to be done. I'd say, going to Matias's point, let's start with a will <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, there you go. Let's 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 crawl. Let's get out of diapers. Then we can crawl. Then we can toddle. Then we can walk. Then we run. Right. And there's sort of this evolution. Um, you know, unfortunately, and I just saw this client did a multi hundreds of millions of dollar round, and now he's doing all this complicated tax structuring when six months before he didn't even have a will, right? So I, I think, you know, one issue is you don't, do not have huge amounts of flexibility um, to, to plan. For instance, venture investors, big funds are not going to invest in a company if the founders put all of his or her shares in a trust. Why? Because they're concerned they're investing in the founder and they're concerned in this trust structure, who's going to end up with these shares, right? So, you know, there's um, limits to the amount of tax planning you can do. I know.